John 15, not John, John's the writer, Revelation 15, the beginning of the book, your title probably says the Revelation of John the Divine, or Saint John the Divine, and then you read verse 1 of Revelation 1, and it says the Revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's the, who the Revelation is all about, and whatever we preach, and whatever topic that we're on, it's about Jesus. All of history is His story. And we saw Him clearly in the Old Testament this morning, and tonight in the New Testament, <clears throat> Revelation 15, and verse 1 says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, <clears throat> seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Look this way, please. Last Sunday morning in the fellowship hall, in the dark, with just some water, some, some light bleeding through uh, the windows, and no water, <laughs> we talked about the wrath of God. And here it talks about seven last plagues, and yet it's not going to happen in this chapter. Chapter 15 is just a glimpse of glory and just a prelude to that. But he's already warning us that starting in chapter 16, seven bowls of wrath are going to be poured out upon the earth. This is at the end of the tribulation. And they make everything else look like nothing. We've already seen the seven seals and the seven trumpets uh, blow. And part of that seventh trumpet is these seven bowls of wrath, a time of great judgment as God pours out his, his punishment upon Christ's rejectors. And yet we see here, even before it begins, good news. Good news from heaven. We have a glimpse of glory and we see uh, some good news. <clears throat> Skip down to, well, verse 1 said the seven last plagues. Skip down to verse number 7 where it says, And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. These are golden bowls, and yet what's poured out is just devastation. So, uh, don't miss the message of chapter 15, this introduction. It's only eight verses long. But Lord willing, it'll probably take us several weeks to go through these good news verses, these few short verses in chapter 15. As we get a glimpse of glory, it's very interesting. We're just looking at verse number 2 tonight. Can you handle just one verse tonight? You see, this message should be about five minutes long, right? And it is. <clears throat> and then some. Verse number 2 says, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Maybe it's good that there's only one verse tonight. Because, honey, write it down on the calendar. What's the date? It's March the 14th, the day I realized I can't put it off anymore. I either have to go to reading glasses, or I have to find a giant print Bible that doesn't feel like the family Bible from the coffee table to hold. I need to hold something in my hand to preach from that's not too big. But I was just barely able to make it through that, and I think it's because I have it mostly memorized. All right, <clears throat> so by next time... <laughs> I may look a little different standing up here. Mark down that date, would you please? Thank you. By the way, I've been putting it off for about five years. We see in verse number two, a C, S-E-A. Now if we read ahead in verse three, we see a song. And Lord willing, we'll talk about that next time. And then later on in this chapter, we see the seven. And that's where we get into a little bit more of the bowls. That's our outline for the next few weeks, the sea, the song, and the seven. And here in verses 1 and 2 that we're looking at tonight, we are in heaven. 
not on earth. We are in heaven. Praise the Lord for that. But we see in verse 2 a sea of glass. What could that be? If it's a sea of glass, it's not an ocean. Don't think of it as a literal sea. As a matter of fact, I want to show you that it's actually a round wash basin like thing. You could call it a laver. Now, when's the last time you heard the word laver? When was it? Yeah, this morning. This morning's message, we talked about the brass laver that you come to in the tabernacle after you pass the brazen altar, then you pass, uh, you come to the brazen laver, which was a, this round dish full of water. Allow me to explain what we're seeing here in verse 2. Remember, this is happening in heaven specifically, just outside the temple in heaven. <clears throat> and remember that God gave Solomon the design for that temple. We talked about it this morning. Um, look down at verse 5, for instance. After that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. It helps if you hold your arm out a little bit further. You can sometimes see what those words are. Verse 5 mentions the temple of the tabernacle. Verse 8, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. See, we're, we're talking in context of the temple here. And we mentioned this morning those two articles of furniture outside the temple made of brass, the altar, and the laver. After the priest offers the sacrifice on that fiery altar. And by the way, there were horns on that altar. By the way, there were flesh hooks that they would hook into the sacrifices. Why did you have to do that? Because sometimes the sacrifice would try to crawl off the altar. And by the way, sometimes we do the, the same thing. <laughs> we need flesh hooks to hold us in place. After the priest offers that sacrifice on that altar, he then steps over next to the laver to wash up before entering the most holy place. Now hold your place in Revelation 15 and go back to your Old Testament to 1 Kings. You're going to want to see this with your own eyes. 1 Kings and chapter 7. All right, 1 Kings 7. <clears throat> And I'll call on one of you to read it. So I'm going to give you plenty of time to get there to 1 Kings 7, where we're going to be. Well, actually, no one on the recording will hear you read. I'll read it. 1 Kings 7, verse 23 says, And he made a molten... Does anyone see the next word? A molten sea. Ten cubits from one brim to the other. It was round all about, and his height was five cubits. And a line of 30 cubits did compass it round about. That would be the, uh, the diameter, or that would be the radius, right, around. And under the brim of it round about, there were knops compassing it. Ten in a cubit, compassing the, what's the next word? The sea, round about. The knops were cast in two rows when it was cast. It stood upon twelve oxen, three looking toward the north, three looking toward the west, three looking toward the south, three looking toward the east, and the next word? The sea was set above upon them, and all their hinder parts were inward, and it was an handbreadth thick. And the brim thereof was wrought like the brim of a cup with flowers of lilies. It contained two thousand Baths. Now that's an Old Testament measurement of liquid or of water. 2,000 baths. <clears throat> Sounds like what we see over in Revelation 15 where it's called a sea. Not an ocean, but the brazen labor outside the temple in the courtyard. Now, I quoted a verse this morning. It was, I didn't give you the reference. It's Ephesians 5.26 that says these words that He, that's Jesus, might sanctify and cleanse it, that's His church, with the washing of water by the, what? The Word. The washing of water by the Word. John 15, 3, Jesus said, Now ye are clean through the 
word. Jesus said, you're clean through the word that I have spoken unto you. The laver represents that water of the word of God and cleansing. The priest had to cleanse up before entering in. Thus he gave us a picture of how we are to approach God in worship. When we come to God, we need to come to him with clean hands uh, in worship. Now the laver was made out of polished brass. Did you know that in these days, in Bible days, polished brass was something very special to the people because it was the flattest, shiniest surface that they could use as a mirror. To that point, this was the best thing that they hadn't come up with cooking sand to make glass. Uh, they hadn't come up with, you know, silver paint to make a real mirror. And so for someone to see themselves, you really had two choices. Go down to a pond that is stagnant and smells and go like this. <laughs> and that's what I look like. Or if you were fortunate to have enough money to have brass, polished brass that was smooth, you could kind of see what you look like. You know what I'm talking about? <clears throat> um, I don't know if you ever heard about the old couple. They, um, they lived way out in the sticks and they had never had much money or anything. And the, the husband had a... Um, Um, he had a, a picture of his wife and he hid it under his mattress. You know why he hid it under his mattress? Um, um, well, it was a secret. But uh, he thought, I'm telling this story wrong. Am I telling this story wrong? You've heard this story before. I wish I could tell you. It just came to my mind and now I can't remember. So far tonight, I need glasses and a new brain. <laughs> Write it down. Has anyone heard this story? You know the story? Well, in the story, it was a mirror. That's right. It was a mirror. Thank you very much. If you've heard the story, I don't have to tell it. If everyone's heard it. The guy finds a mirror. He's never seen it before. And he looks at it and he says, well, it's a picture of my pappy. You know, because that's all he remembered his dad looking like. So he hides it under his mattress. That's how it goes. Thank you. And his wife says, what kind of secret is my husband keeping from me? And so once he's snoring, sawing logs, she goes and digs it out. And she looks at it and she says, so that's the hag he's been running around with. <laughs> I knew he was hiding something from me. <laughs> Next time we'll tell it better with your help. Thank you. Speaking of stories that just come to my mind, since I haven't learned any lesson tonight already, my wife has a beautiful vanity. Did it, was it an heirloom? Your aunt's vanity, and it sits in our bathroom now. It's beautiful wood. It doesn't have a mirror, you know, no mirror at all. Now, I don't have to tell you what a vision of loveliness my bride is, a stunning work of art, timeless, who does not age. What is he buttering her up for tonight? <laughs> there might be something I saw online that I need to buy <clears throat> with my stimulus. <clears throat> and yours. Anyway, um, <laughs> she just needed a mirror for it. And as faultless as this woman is, I bought her a mirror, and she chose the mirror, and it's one of those magnifying mirrors. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I don't know what it does, it lends, some kind of lens effect or whatever, but it just looks like a regular mirror until you look in it. And I was there the first time when she did, and she went, ah! <laughs> but the good news is when you back away, things just kind of blend in, everything's all good. She didn't need any help. So I want to buy that. Anyway, um, that thing on the line. Um, where were we? Yeah, the mirror. Polished brass. That's where we were. How long did we spend on that? <laughs> a mirror. Polished brass is like a mirror, which, like water in the Bible, both are pictures 
of the Word of God. Remember in 1 Corinthians 13 it says, Now we see through a glass darkly. That's a mirror, a looking glass is the idea. Probably polished brass in that day. Darkly. You don't really see it as well. But then one day face to face we see Him in all of His glory. Jesus Christ. Now, if you look at verse 2 again, notice something else about these saints. It says, I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name. What's the next word? Stand. Stand on the sea of glass. Just like the kids sang this morning, they stand alone on the Word of God. Yes, they are standing on the Word, symbolic of the victory that they have won by way of the Word, the living Word, Jesus Christ. God's Word stands. The Bible says, forever, O Lord, thy Word is settled in heaven. It stands. We said this morning, it should step on us. But we do stand on the Word of God. And that is if you're a Bible believer. You sure do. Uh, are you a Bible believer tonight? We're a Bible believing church. Next in verse 2 we see fire. Fire, a symbol of testing in Scripture. Things that are tried by fire, proven by fire. A sign of testing. 1 Peter 1.7 says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and glory, praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. This, that verse right there, 1 Peter 1.7, describes to a T these in our text. You realize who these people are in Revelation 15.2? These are people who had never heard the gospel before the rapture. So they're left behind and they are exposed to the truth. And in spite of all the odds and all the threats against their life, they believe and they follow Jesus Christ and thereby they are saved. Though the Bible says they have to endure to the end. You just got to go until you die. You'll be starved because you won't be able to buy anything, though I believe God could supply for them as He gave Elijah uh, uh, food by the ravens. But they will suffer much hardship. They'll be persecuted. They'll be tortured. Now, torture is one thing when somebody's torturing you. <clears throat> And I imagine it's pretty bad, right? But you know, some of the most gruesome tortures you'll read about in Fox's Book of Martyrs and from Josephus and others in, in secular history is when you see people who were tortured by, by saying, I'm bringing your daughter in here and I'm going to torture her in front of you until you recant and say, I no longer follow Jesus Christ. That feels like a different story, doesn't it? I mean, if you're looking for an excuse to recant, if you're looking for some way to rationalize and justify, and it's just words, Lord, I still believe, but I'm going to say this to save my little one's life. Many, many recanted in the face of that kind of torture. And remember, everything's magnified in the tribulation. So can you imagine what the torture would be like that people will endure. Meanwhile, here we are on this side of the rapture. It's hard to get people to live for Jesus when in that day they will die for Jesus. These are those who refuse to take the mark of the beast that stand on the word, this sea of glass. That's who we're reading about here in verse number two. And eventually they lose their heads and they awake immediately, standing on the Word of God, praising the name of God. And the end of the verse says, holding the harps of God. This is a verse of victory. And we'll be there to see it live with our own eyes. Now I'm going to worship Jesus and celebrate Him throughout eternity by far more 
than anyone else. But if you're like me, you look forward to meeting some Old Testament saints, right? And viewing them like heroes. Listen, these are going to be heroes who existed after us. Perhaps they're alive today, but they will exist on earth after us. And so we'll be looking around at heaven with all these who preceded us, and even some who came after us, great heroes of the faith. Listen, you be a hero of the faith in between. Now is our chance, and everything's working for us, and it's easy for us compared to those that we read about, Old Testament and Revelation here. How do they do it? How do they become heroes? They stand on the Word, even if they have to stand alone. But this is a verse of victory. Now that was a little deep. Let's give it some practical application before we go home. Let's make this relevant tonight. Three lessons to learn from this. Number one, these are all quick and simple and easy. Number one, we must be clean to serve God correctly. God wants to use a clean vessel. He tells us over and over in His Word, in so many words, that He doesn't put His holy hand into a filthy glove to do His work. He works through purity. There's power in purity. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Blessed is the man who stands not in the way of sinners. Blessed is the man that doesn't sit in the seat of the scornful. That's who produces fruit, whose leaf shall not wither. We need to be clean, clean tools for him to pick up and use. Now, a lot of us pray the prayer, Lord, use me. It's a good prayer. I've prayed it many times. Lord, use me. And you know what I mean when I say that. I know what you mean if you say, Lord, use me. But I've discovered that there's a better prayer to pray sometimes. And that is, Lord, I know you want to use me. Lord, make me usable. Make me usable. It's not like I'm begging you to use me. Change your mind to use me. You want to use me. I stand in the way of that. Make me usable. We need to be clean to serve God correctly. That's the message of the laver. With the water. The reflecting pool. The mirror of the word. The water of the word. Sanctification. That brass altar that came first, that was justification. And then next we came to that labor, that's sanctification. Lord, use me. Make me usable. Back when I was in Bible college, it was the summer of 92. And later that summer, I would, I would propose marriage uh, to a lovely lady. It wasn't Kimberly. No. <laughs> it was. We already discussed that. But all that summer, I worked in a local church in Florida. Just me and one other bachelor. And all we had was a few pots and pans. Who knows how to use those? We had, what was that little oven? It was some kind of a toaster oven type thing. Put 99 cent pizzas in there, you know what I'm saying? Bachelor, bachelor food. We could boil water, you know, ramen, brain food, those sort of things. But we would open up recipe books and they all said, they all start, all the recipes start with take a clean pan or pot and, well, okay, so we're out. Um, we don't have anything clean. That leaves me out. You know, I wonder if God feels that way sometimes. Take a clean... Oh, where is one? I need to find a clean vessel to use. He wants to do so much with us. Well, we can't expect God to use us if we're harboring sin. And so if you come to church having not read the Bible hardly at all all week, not prayed a lick... Stay up late Saturday night watching some movie with sinful content and then drag yourself into church on Sunday morning and sit there saying, I just don't get much out of church. 
Well, listen, God Himself couldn't bless that person. What if we all gathered together in God's house with a spirit of expectancy, excited, having been with God that very morning already, and all week previous leading up to it, and we didn't need to be entertained or woke up, we'd have us some incredible services, that's for sure. God uses those kind of clean vessels. The, f the first lesson is the labor, daily cleansing. Second lesson, there are some things worse than death. We just talked about torture here. Some things worse than death. Remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 10, 28. Jesus said, and I quote, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body, in hell. There are some things worse than death. These tribulation saints say, we will not bow to the Antichrist. We'd rather die, and then they will die for their faith. We will not take the mark. Death first. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember those guys? Uh-huh. My shack, your shack, and a bungalow. Whatever their names were. They had Hebrew names before they were changed to these names. I heard uh, an old uh, uh, black preacher said, uh, what did he say? Uh, I forgot again. I need to stop going off script is what I need to do. Uh, yeah, my shack... My shack, your shack, and a bad Negro. That's what he said. <laughs> a bad Negro. No, a bad Negro is what his name was. What did those guys say? Our God will deliver us. But if not, we will not bow. We will not bend. Well, if you're listening to my voice right now and you're not saved, consider that there's something coming that's worse than death. Worse than death. And, don't miss this, we all need to ask ourselves, do I have a faith that's willing to die for? And if I do, then it'll be easy to live for it. Don't tell me you'd die for Him if you won't witness for Him now. Don't tell me you'd die for Him if you won't tithe now, if you won't serve Him now. So there's the lesson of the labor, daily cleansing, and then secondly, some things are worse than death. And number three, we end on a high note, it pays to serve God. These stand on that sea of glass, holding these harps, and they have eternal celebration then, forevermore. Now that's better than a fairy tale. It pays to serve God. In this life, sometimes, not always. In eternity, absolutely. It pays to serve God. These stand on the crystal sea, praising the Lord, holding the harps. These are winners. That's right, they're winners. They escape tribulation. They escape hell for all eternity. And I love that word, winners. Yeah, real winners. Not Charlie Sheen, duh, winning. Not that kind of winners. No. The opposite of what Ted Turner said. You remember years ago, Ted Turner said, Christians are a bunch of losers and bozos that need a crutch to lean on in this life. This Bible says we win. We win. Lord, tonight, thank, thank you for winning the victory for us. For blazing a trail ahead. for leading captivity captive, holding the keys of hell and death, taking our hell for us, paying for our sin on the cross as if you had done, giving us your righteousness as if we had righteousness. What a gift, Lord. What an unspeakable gift. May we give our lives trying to speak of that unspeakable gift. 
And Lord, now, as we see the state of our world, we're encouraged to read the back of the book and be reminded that we are winners, that we are living in the age of grace, perhaps the easiest time to live. And though, Lord, we don't minimize anyone's struggles, thank you for the heroes who've gone before us. Thank you for those who will come after us. Help us, Lord, to be Christian heroes for you. And we will cast those crowns at your feet one day. Thank you for the mirror that is your word that has blessed our heart this day. I give you sincere gratitude for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Let's stand right where we're at as this